Hi, everyone. This is Matt Britton, founder and CEO of Suzy. Thank you so much for joining uh, today's edition of the State of Consumer webinar. Um, we're here in late July in a really hot summer across the United States, and hopefully everyone's staying cool um, and having a great summer of family and friends. Today, we're going to be discussing a really interesting topic, one that's really on the tip of everyone's tongue right now, which is a topic of artificial intelligence. More specifically, we're going to be diving deep into what the rise of AI means for the back to school season. This is the time of year um, in late July that we normally do start to turn our attention towards September, towards the back to school season, which is such a big season from a volume perspective and a brand perspective for so many of our um, customers and partners. Um, and often we zoom out and talk about the back to school shopping season kind of in totality. But given just the craze that is AI here in 2023, we thought it made sense to kind of um, double click a little bit into the rise of AI and what it could mean for the back to school season. So we've done some uh, primary research with our uh, Suzy platform. We're really excited to share with you the results as well as get insights from two really fascinating guests that we were able to bring on today. Um, so in a little bit, you're going to be hearing from Lee Gall, who's the director of growth at CopyLeaks, uh, which is an AI plagiar AI based plagiarism and a content platform. Um, and Lee's got some really great um, insights into what he's seeing on the AI front, uh, as well as Adam Kahn, who's a chief uh, chief creative officer at Gray, which is obviously one of Madison Avenue's most prolific advertising agencies. Um, and Adam's worked on some of the biggest brands in the world and really has a unique point of view um, in how AI really impacts brands and messaging. Um, in this new world we're living in. So really excited to hear from them. But first, um, equally as excited to dive in to some of the insights that we've uncovered with our Suzy platform. So those of you who don't know Suzy, we are an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform uh, that works for some of the biggest brands in the world to help power on-demand consumer research across the product development life cycle, everything from R&D to innovation, to ad testing, to um, customer experience research. Um, Suzy's tapped by brands across many industries. And of course, we use our own tool to power our research today. Um, the study that we're going to be acknowledging today was conducted on July 10th with a sample size of 1,000 consumers within the Suzy proprietary panel. The sample census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region, uh, the data I'm going to be citing today. So. As discussed, the back to school season is indeed upon us once again, um, but this school year is definitely set to be unlike any other. Um, at the end of last year, we really start to see the impact of AI impact students. Um, teachers really didn't know how to handle it. It was such a, um, it was innovation that had an onset that was so quick that the education system didn't, and in many ways still does not have, know how to react to it. So that creates obviously a lot of confusion, um, a lot of misalignment across educators, across parents, across students. And the same thing really happened when the internet itself was first invented in, in the early 2000s when um, you know teachers were increasingly concerned about how students were going to use the internet itself to conduct um, studying and, and write term papers and things of that nature. And obviously we had tools like Wikipedia, which quickly replaced the encyclopedia. Um, now with AI, it's kind of taken those concerns and the challenges and the innovation we've seen in the education space to a whole new level. Um, so the AI revolution is already transforming education. Um, there's been much discussion about how teachers should ingest AI as a technology into the classroom. And there's really two schools of thought. You have the more traditional education professionals who say there's no role for AI in the classroom, that students really need to learn the fundamentals of reading and writing um, and comprehension to be able to grow as functioning adults in society. But at the same time, you have an equal amount of more progressive thinkers, um, and I would put myself definitely in this camp, that AI is not going anywhere, and it's going to only grow in its importance. And to hold on to the past while there's a whole new revolution in learning, which is really going to evolve human humanity as we know it, we shouldn't worry about how things were, and we should be focused on how, how, how things are going to be because our foreign counterparts in China and around the world are certainly gonna be leaning into this into their education systems. And that's who our children are gonna be competing with in the global stage 15, 20 years from now. So what does that look like? What does it look like to integrate AI into an education curriculum where kids are still learning, but they're learning in a new way. Um, they're leveraging these AI tools to be more impactful students and, and, and focusing on up-leveling their skill sets the same way that many employers uh, need to do as well. Um, Brands obviously must be wondering how parents are feeling about this. And that was one of the things we obviously dug into with our Suzy research. Um, you know, what we found is that 65% of students was 
third-party research, would be happy for AI to complete a teacher's administrative task, meaning teachers are actually okay with, uh, parents are okay with teachers actually leveraging AI to help them institute a curriculum at school. Now, we also dug deep into our own research to find out, okay, well, that's how parent, parents feel about teachers leveraging AI, but what about their own kids? How do they feel about it? Um, and the first thing that, point, that came out to us is that out of the list of worries that parents have for their kids, AI really isn't on the top of the list um, this fall. So a lot of it is played out in the media, but it actually, if you talk to parents specifically, they, they will not say consistently that AI is something that has necessarily a huge worry to them um, at this point. So in this webinar, we're going to really tell you what parents are thinking about education AI, and we're going to be unpacking how parents are feeling about sending their kids back to school, how they're feeling about the rise of AI, what concerns specifically do parents have about AI, and what do parents want to see from brands in terms of AI, which is a whole new topic and one I know many brands are really looking to get their arms around. So first, how are parents feeling about sending their kids back to school? So um, parents are feeling positive. Their biggest concern, as always, is really their children's safety. Um, and, you know, they're, they're more positive than they have been in past years. In past years, when we've been doing these webinars, we were still dealing with the aftermath of COVID. And I specifically remember um, webinars with Crayola and other clients of ours about, you know, ki kids, um, you know, having parents really freak out about, are they wearing masks? When should they be wearing masks? How it's going to impact their social lives? We're not really seeing that pop up. And that's the first time that COVID has not played a major role in our back to school research really since the onset of COVID in 2020. So overall, that's probably a big driver on why parents are generally feeling more excited about back to school and only 16% are really feeling uh, concerned about it. Safety and well-being is obviously um, a huge um, point of, of concern for parents. We've seen continued headlines about um, school safety, school shootings, unfortunately, um, in the past several years. And I think that's why that continues to be a, you know, a, a huge emphasis of concern for parents. They're also concerned about their uh, child's mental well-being. We've seen continued growth and increase of mental health issues amongst younger um, kids, especially um, teenagers. And social media is often very much connected to those mental health issues. And then more generally, um, children starting a new class is another area of concerns. But AI, as we mentioned, um, is really at the at the, the least of, the, of their worry list that only 21% of um, parents have said the rise of AI is a big concern. So again, why, while it's at the, on the headlines, it's not really on the, on the list, at the top of the list for many parents when it comes to back to school. So, um, what, you know, what's the takeaway? Well, brands can explore opportunities for AI to enhance uh, children's safety. They're, this is in the Wall Street Journal, but um, many schools are looking at new technologies that are AI driven to help address that core concern of children's safety. Um, this is an example of an AI enabled robot um, that a Santa Fe school district is looking at testing with surveillance that, that kind of goes around the campus and, um, you know, can detect things that um, may seem a little bit suspicious or out of the normal to alert the proper authorities or security at the school. So there's definitely a role, a role for AI to help address um, these concerns that have definitely been growing over the years in terms of when parents drop off their kids at school, is their kid going to be safe? Um, so how are parents feeling about the rise of AI? Um, our general insight is that parents are open to the possibilities, both uh, for themselves um, and, and their children. Um, despite what we're seeing in the media, most parents actually feel positive about AI. And again, you'll, it depends upon who you talk to on the day and the, the headlines are so dynamic and the world's changing so fast. You know, sometimes the same person will tell you they're excited about it and they're kind of concerned about it um, at, based upon what they're reading and seeing. Um, the reality is, as we all know, it's not going anywhere though. And it's something that we all as employers, as parents, as students have to contend with uh, moving forward. Um, brands and, and parents were especially welcome AI making things easier for them. Um, and when it comes to parents, um, you know, they're all in favor of AI that will make daily tasks easier or more efficient um, and allow them to spend their time on the things that matter most. So when it comes to brands communicating the benefits of AI, especially to parents, it's really all about making their lives better. And if you think about a tool like Uber and why it was so successful, successful in the popular lexicon, it was because you hit a button and you could, it could take you anywhere you want to go without even having to talk to the driver. It saved you time. It made life easier. It was convenient. 
And when it comes to AI, especially in the lives of parents um, within the realm of their families and their children, convenience, ease of use, um, saving time, those are going to be things that really will gravitate them towards maybe some of the modern day tools that are now being invented. Uh, it was surprising to me, at least, that nearly half of parents um, that we surveyed are using chat GPT. Um, you know, it, it really is um, a lumpy issue where some areas of the country, some industries, you'll find that everyone's using it. And in some areas of the country and in other industries, people are barely even familiar with it. Um, so it's one of these things that's going to take a, a lot of time. The, the knowledge and use of these tools are not evenly distributed yet, as normally is the case when new innovations come on so quickly um, in society. So um, how to use AI for family time um, and boost productivity. Again, those are areas of content that branches have to think about if they are playing around the AI space, if they want that kind of brand equity um, value from AI, create content, um, help educate and help educate in areas that matter most to, to parents, which again is around convenience um, and saving time. But you know, the takeaway is that 63% believe that AI will indeed have a positive impact on society. Um, and 60% believe that ultimately it could have a positive impact on their children's education. So it's not the dirty word, it is not the thing that educators should run away from, because I think parents are open to it. Um, again, that's great to see because you know you can juxtapose this against headlines, which show that you know that, that AI could spell the end of the world, right? <laughs> so if you want to, um, you can kind of Google enough information um, that will scare you away from AI and scare um, educators away from AI. Um, and it's good to see that there's definitely an optimism and willingness to learn more um, about it. So um, where do um, parents see um, AI as having the most benefit for their students? First and foremost, AI will help children with problem solving. Um, as number two, it will help with their efficiency. So 40% of parents said um, they're, they're optimistic that AI can help with their children's efficiency um, and also help their children become tech savvy. And, you know, going back to the internet revolution in the year 2000, which was 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago, Again, there are many schools who did not want internet in the classroom, did, did not adopt modern day um, educational technical tools like Blackboard um, into the classroom, were very late. And I think that was at the behest of the students. I think students need to be embracing these tools. Um, I'm still surprised that many schools aren't teaching the use of Excel and, and you know PowerPoint um, type tools in early, at early ages, because those tools, I believe, are so incredibly um, powerful and really an, a prerequisite for uh, gaining any level of success in so many different industries. So still to this day, some of the 2000s era technology still isn't adequately integrated into the curriculum of, of you know, educational systems. And I think that that's, that's really coming um, at the disadvantage of those students. So I'm hoping AI, we can learn from those lessons and really start to embrace these tools. Um, the number one thing parents want to see is back to school season is technology for schoolwork. So, um, you know, they want um, this technology to help their students, uh, their, their um, students understand the type of schoolwork that needs to be done that helps them organize ideas, helps them organize different assignments that they have. Um, and they're also looking for brands to discount their products for back to school, which was really is an AI issue, but something that they're looking for uh, from brands uh, specifically. Um, there's also kind of obviously a growing use of brands of these AI powered chatbots. And the more the AI tools get adopted in schools for kids, the more parents will become aware of these tools and the more they're going to expect brands to, to adopt these tools in a way that they communicate with their customers, whether you're an airline or you're a hotel um, or you're a retailer. You know, I think these AI powered chatbots are so much better than the tools that we had just five years ago, where if you were trying to chat with an airline, it would not understand what you're looking for. These natural language processing technologies really allow you to have pretty sophisticated conversations with this technology and more often than not get the answers that you're actually looking for. Um, so if your brand is already using AI, certainly lean into it. Lean into it with your messaging, uh, with parents during back to school season. Given the research we found, it really makes no sense to shy away from it. It's not going to scare your customer um, into thinking that it's going to create some sort of detriment for them or their family. Um, it's something that they want to learn more about, and they're overwhelmingly positive. So don't get scared by the headlines. There is optimism around this. Um, obviously, 
there's so many different applications of AI when it comes to education, not the least of which is translation um, and language. So when you look, look at kids um, learning different languages, um, do, tools like Duolingo are really starting to embrace AI and make it so much more powerful for kids to learn languages and make it so much more powerful as a study-based tool. So obviously the rub with kids is you don't want AI to do the work for them. Right. We've all heard examples of kids getting caught in the last year using AI to write the term paper for them. They just asked a chat GPT to write a term paper and they hand it as theirs. That they're not learning anything from doing that. But should they use these tools to create outlines? Should they use these tools to conduct primary research um, or to give them high level ideas? I would say yes. And that's really the fine line I think parents need to walk um, with their kids when it comes to using AI for school is. You can't have AI do the work for you. You still need to do the work because otherwise you're not learning anything and you're not really differentiating yourself. And I think that's really the key. Um, but there's a lot of tools out there. So whether it's Duolingo to learn languages or pl um, platforms like Quizlet that allows um, kids to leverage AI to, to study and prep, um, all these tools are now um, integrating AI into their platforms. Um, and you can see a lot of these platforms are already actually leveraging AI in their comms more um, you know, to great success, because again, parents do have the openness to, to be embracing these type of tools. So as I mentioned earlier, despite all that, there obviously are concerns that parents have about AI. And, you know, I kind of just mentioned this, but their biggest concern is an over-reliance on the technology. And because of that, one in four definitely have a level of um, cautiousness towards um, AI. So um, the three really key areas when it comes to concerns about AI in general, and of course it relates to the students is, over-reliance on the technology. So if you're too over-reliant on, on this AI technology, does it mean that, you know, kids aren't going to know how to think for themselves and, and engage in critical thinking or, or comprehension because they're just having the technology do everything. I often go back to the episode, uh, an episode of the show, The Office, which is one of my favorite shows of all time, where uh, Michael Scott and Dwight Schrute were driving a car and the navigation system tells them to uh, drive their car into a lake and they proceed to drive their car into a lake. And Michael Scott saying, well, the technology can't be wrong. It can't be wrong. And they run their car into the lake. That's kind of the, the risk with AI, right? Is that you get so reliant on it that you forget about your own intuitions and your own skill sets. And that, again, is where the fine line is with some of these technologies. Obviously, there is a persistent concern about data privacy. Um, that's likely more of a concern of the parents and the students. But you know, people are putting their private information. Where is it going to go? There's already a ton of, uh, you know, lawsuits and legislation and stories about, um, you know, private data put into these AI models and somehow getting exposed. And obviously, you don't want it to take away human creativity. Um, but again, the same concerns were made when Photoshop was embedded and um, so many other graphic design tools were made that it would take away creativity. And I would argue it hasn't. But, you know, they are concerns nonetheless. Um, so I, I thought this the headline was really funny. Chat GPT is down as a new dog ate my homework. Um, outages of the popular AI, at least students, professionals are like scrambling. Um, and you see some tweets like, you know, I have a deadline. Why is chat GPT down? Many students, for better or worse, are already kind of relying on it. Um, when we hear later, um, you know, about some of the AI uh, plagiarism detective tools out there, I think schools are going to are slowly smartening up to this. And um, there are no shortage of tools that educators can use now to see if that these AI tools are used to engage in just straight plagiarism. So I do think it's going to be something where the same AI technology that allows you to plagiarize also exists to allow you to detect plagiarism. And I think because of that, and because of the proliferation of those tools, um, you know, copy leaks being one of them, that yeah, I, I do think that students are, might smarten up to it. And, and obviously we'll hear more about that uh, when we bring on our guests. Um, the concerns about the impact of AI on children's education, almost like the byproduct, is obviously the children to become lazy um, and lose their creativity. Um, so obviously parents want students to, you know, develop a work ethic and have discipline because that is going to be needed, um, as they go into the workforce and as they go into college and beyond. And that is really, again, the fine line is not having a technology that does all the work for you. It takes away all your discipline and work ethic, because even if you know how to command a tool in the right way, you're not going to actually have, know how to do the real work when you become an adult. So how do you leverage these tools 
while still having a work ethic, while still having the discipline needed uh, to be a good student. Um, you know, teachers are saying AI is a disaster. How am I going to know is, um, who's cheating? Obviously, it, it comes to tools and technologies that kind of allow you to do it. Um, the other big issue with AI is that AI is about screens. And many parents, rightly so, are concerned about screen time, right? Um, many schools have introduced laptops um, and screens into the classroom. And for many students, when a screen is introduced, it takes them away and distracts them from really the core aspects of being a, a student, right? And this is going to even create more screen time and more distraction. Uh, AI is a technology that lives um, within the internet and on computers and on phones. So by nature, it involves more screen time. And that definitely is an overarching concern of parents when it comes to it. Um, so if your brand isn't using AI, um, you also can go back to the basics. Um, you can basically start to figure out ways that you can start to have AI within your messaging so you can at least signal to parents, if you're in the back to school world, that it, it means something to you, that you're helping, um, you know, that you're helping them with this journey of learning and embracing this new world. Um, we saw this during COVID where customers trusted brands more than the government for relaying information about COVID. Um, they looked to brands on social media to help give them direction in terms of what to cook for their family, what activities to do, how to treat safety of COVID around certain situations. I look at this as very much a parallel um, where brands can play a leadership role, um, it, you know, because I don't think the government will step up in that sort of way with AI. I think they have bigger fish to fry right now. And I think, you know, many parents are going to look at brands for education, look at brands for direction. I think it definitely creates, um, you know, a huge opportunity for brands to leverage their creative in ways to um, show how, what they're building. Um, even this is a great ad I thought by Lego, which shows, okay, today you're building these sorts of things. Tomorrow you're designing these sorts of things. Um, so it's kind of has a technical bent to it, but it starts with the basics. I thought that was a really brilliant creative execution uh, by Lego. So what do parents want to see from brands in terms of AI? Um, as I mentioned, they're really craving more knowledge and education on AI. Um, parents have a lot to learn. We all do about AI. That's why so many of you are on this uh, webinar today. Um, and parents lag behind. And when the parents lag behind kids on AI, you know, that's where I think they really start to get concerned because they want to feel like they're in control. And if parents know less than their own students do, then they're, they're going to feel in the dark. So it really creates an opportunity for brands to educate parents going into this back to school season. Listen, we know your students are going to be using chat GPT and, and using these tools. Here's what you need to know. Here are best practices. Best practices. Here's how you can monitor their chats that they're having. Um, here's how you can help them. Here's how you can learn. And I think when parents learn through the lens of their, their children, they can also learn through the lens of their own careers. So I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, education. We're trying to educate all of you, our community, our customers on AI. I think brands have the same um, opportunity. Um, just in terms of the usage from students, 50% of students uh, aged 12 to 18 say they've used ChatGPT for school, um, and 26% of parents say their children have used it. So that shows the gap of where parents really aren't necessarily in the loop of how impactful AI has been um, or how much it's been adopted by their own kids. Um, basically, half of the parents are in the dark that their kids are using it. Um, so education, education, education really um, is a huge opportunity here. Um, you know, they all believe it's important for the children to learn about AI. Um, so it's really the role of brand to do it. So I'm going to jump ahead and bring on um, our guests because there's definitely a lot to dig into here. Um, I know I covered a lot in a half an hour, but I want to leave time for the experts. So I'd like to welcome um, to the stage uh, Adam Kahn, Chief Creative Officer at Gray, and Lee Gall, Director of Growth of Copy Week. So gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for joining. Um, so excited to, uh, to engage in this discussion today. Yeah, no, thanks for, for having us on here. Um, yeah. You know, certainly. I think Adam, uh, Adam, you just need to turn your camera on. I'm having a technical difficulty. Okay. I might just be right back. No worries. Yeah. Awesome. So, so go on, Lee. Yeah, no, I just say, I mean, it's, it's um, professionally and personally and everything else, uh, the discussion around 
uh, AI in schools, I think is, is just such a hot topic. And, um, you know, just for, for people out there who don't know me, um, I, I work at Copy Leaks, and you mentioned us. Thank you for mentioning us um, within uh, the slide deck presentation. Um, <clears throat> I don't typically do a lot of pitching, um, but it, it's appropriate here to, to mention that, um, you know, my company's a, been a plagiarism detection uh, company. We're actually an AI company. We have an AI model that uh, analyzes text and we can find exact matches so we can find old school plagiarism but we also have a tool that detects AI content and um, we have seen a huge uptick in adoption for all of our uh, high school and university students using uh, AI to write um, and uh, one of the things I think I shared with you guys when we had a, a quick touch base before the, the call is um, when we did this study that we measured uh, what happened when uh, these schools did a scan of, of the work that the kids were doing. And then what happened when they told them that they now had this capability to detect AI and the college student uh, usage just dipped um, wow. pretty significantly. And the high school usage went up <laughs> and the kids were like, hey, fine. All right, do you know? That's okay. I'm gonna double down and keep using it. Um, and we don't really take a position either way, but but I think at the end of the day, when it comes to using AI, I disagree with the idea uh, or the thought that that it's going to impact the the kids' ability to um, do critical thinking. And I think actually, you know, we see a world where, um, at least in the short to midterm, you could use um, the idea of of designing a prompt as part of the exercise. For example, you you say, okay, um, in this assignment, you're going to use uh, ChatGPT. Um, but what you're going to do is you're going to explain to me what your research was and your hypothesis behind the prompt that you created. Is it right. a few shot prompt? What are the examples that you used in that prompt? And then what is the completion that came out? What's the answer? And how did that differ? And let's discuss that process. Like you show your work in mathematics, you should show your work when you create these prompts uh, using ChatGPT. Because number one, that helps to engage your creative uh, in your analytical thought processes, but also it teaches you how to be better at using generative AI to get the output that you need because it's really is only as good as the prompt that you design. Yeah, absolutely. Adam, welcome. Do you want to maybe also tell us a little bit about yourself and and Gray and, and the work that you've done? Sure. Thanks, Matt. Hello, everyone. Uh, Adam Kahn, Chief Creative Officer at Graven West. Um, I've been in advertising for 17 years. Um, but I have a lot of heart and passion behind uh, blending creativity and technology to uh, enrich storytelling. And I'm a huge fan of AI and how it's not just going to impact uh, industries at a whole, as a whole, but it's going to kind of breathe new life and creativity into uh, our daily lives. So I'm excited to be here today. So Adam, in, so we'll start with you in terms of AI's impact on advertising. I mean, no, it's not necessarily the, the subject of this, but it obviously there's a lot of correlation. How are your clients looking at the use of AI to help create everything from briefs to even the actual creative output? Um, are they embracing it? Are they, are they um, pushing you guys away from it? And where do you see it all headed um, in the year ahead? All right, that's a loaded question to unpack. Um, I would say similar to your upfront, there is a lot of skepticism uh, there's also excitement. And then I think there's also a lot of clients that are doing things behind the scenes without us knowing about it. And I think from our industry, you're seeing brands start to implement AI from a logistic standpoint, right? Improving internal processes. But then from an ad agency and production standpoint, they're using it to iterate and optimize existing channels. So for example, um, some of our clients are doing tests and learns on Amazon pages using ChatGPT to analyze what language and tags are using across different uh, A plus pages uh, month after month to see if sales increase or decrease based on um, the, the tags they used. And then from a visual standpoint, uh, as a creative and a storyteller and someone that spent, you know, 20 years using Photoshop, uh, it's actually uh, enhanced my ability to create, I'd say, faster, but then also allow me to visualize a lot of complex daydreams and thoughts I had that I once couldn't 
visualize. And we're starting to take that and work with clients on how to uh, optimize production. Right. So instead of booking all these, although I love going on these beautiful <laughs> excursions and trips to do shoots, some of the more product focused CPG stuff that you're going to see in catalogs or on the shelf or back to school, we will take 3D renders of them that are that are literally the identical to the product, but we will use AI to generate the background to kind of streamline a bit of the production and also get our product to the market a lot faster than we could prior. Um, we are we are mentioning that we are using AI in this process to not fool people, but at the same time, I think based on some of our initial research, most people look at the product and the background is just additive. So whether or not you see a beautiful water bottle on a marble countertop or a wood or a metal, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, they just want to believe and see themselves with that product. So right. we're, we're making some iterations based on some of the real-time feedback we're getting. Yeah, totally makes sense. And Lee, when it comes to, I mean, Adam brought up the point just in terms of like authenticity, right? And understanding, um, allowing the consumer to understand what's real and what's not. I imagine, you know, that's a kind of big thesis behind your company. And especially as we enter an election year next year, when you look mm -hmm. at, um, you know, when you look at things like plagiarism detection and even like deep fakes and things like that, and, yeah. and I imagine you guys see opportunities there as well as a business, because this is going to be a continuing issue of the consumer mm -hmm. truly understanding what's real and what isn't. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it is a big conversation. And in fact, um, yeah, luckily, we, we've been across um, the AI text space um, about a month after ChatGPT was released, actually, in, uh, the 4th of January, we released the, the AI detection. And, and it's been nothing but um, really a groundswell of interest and opportunity, but also an opportunity for us to, to educate people about, um, you know, how best to think about this this new world that we're living in and uh, yeah. we're hearing from media and we're hearing from you know uh, also a lot of scientific researchers who who want to um, ensure that the research that's being published is is authentic and is not yeah. hallucinated and you know we're not sure as an industry uh, how best to rein in hallucinations you know there's new research papers every day on on how we might do that and how we might not. Um, but, you know, we're, we're at a point now where elections are coming up very quick. And, you know, Russia was spending millions of dollars um, a week to, to create propaganda at scale. Well, imagine the amount of propaganda at scale that any kind of bad actor can create now. Um, and with the prevalence of, of diffusion models where the, the text to image generators, uh, the text to video, um, you know, you're getting these really robust um, multimodal AI systems that can create images that are very, um, very uh, realistic. You know, right. uh, it's, I, what my worry is, is that we'll get to a point where, you know, we've gone past the, you know, don't believe everything you hear and only half of what you see to nobody's going to believe anything at all anymore. I hope that that's not the case. I hope what happens instead is that people develop more of a critical eye for for what they see out there and just go, ah, you know what, maybe I should take a step back and, and you know, maybe the Pope uh, isn't wearing, you know, a, uh, a Prada puff jacket and, uh, you know, a gold chain. Um, you know, maybe that's a fake image. Maybe, you know, um, these things are not real. But, you know, it's a big topic for everyone that we're talking to uh, right now. This is information in the short and to midterm is kind of a scary um, byproduct of the scale that the generative AI tools are allowing people to, to make that stuff at, so. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I, I read a few times that one solve of, of sort of like authenticating content could be the blockchain. So, you know, it's where those two technologies could really meet because the blockchain never really took off at for the NFTs where it did and it was kind of boom bust cycle. But if it truly is the ledger is an authenticator, then, mm -hmm. you know, anything I create that really is me could be connected to me on the blockchain. And that could be a way where those two technologies really connect. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's such an insightful take on that because, um, 
you know, even early on in um, when Dolly had come out, I went to an event, a uh, two and two NYC event, which is an advertising and marketing event here in uh, New York City. Uh, and uh, I was speaking um, with someone and, and you know, the ChatGPT had only just rolled out and I had just started playing with it. But, you know, it, it seems like at least for images, the idea of NFTs makes so much sense in terms of saying, listen, here's a way to actually, um, you know, mint an image and have it be authentic and, and exist on the blockchain. But there are also other um, programs out there. Uh, WorldCoin is one example um, which is basically a, a worldwide program to create a proof of personhood. Um, you know, Sam Altman from, from uh, OpenAI is a, an early investor in this. And essentially, the idea is you have, you go to an orb uh, at a certain location and have your iris scanned. And that creates a, an instance of a unique key in a blockchain so that now when you interact online, you have uh, a proof of personhood. Uh, orb scan. Uh, I'm actually an early uh, participant in that. I got my iris scanned a few months ago at an orb. Uh, and, you know, it, what I think is interesting about it is it also doubled as the opportunity to uh, be the framework for new economics around AI. You know, the idea of being able to create things at scale means that um, ultimately we need to figure out a way to compensate the, the vast swaths of, of the workforce that may be displaced by that. And that means that it behooves companies and organizations and governments to create equity. Uh, and there needs to be a framework in, in which we would distribute that equity. So the world coin is the, an early example of trying to solve for that thing. I think we need to, as a, as a, uh, as a species, think long horizon about what AI might do. We need to get our AI mindsets um, yeah. and they need to think like sci-fi writers about what the downstream impacts could be in 50 years instead of the next two to three. 100%. And I mean, you know, we all know there's a big strike going on right now, um, SAG AFTRA and, and, you know, the actors, the SAG actors, one major sticking point for them is they want to make sure that any use of their likeness, um, you know, to generate a new performance, you know, turns out that they get compensated for that. Uh, because right. the risk is that you could take Scarlett Johansson's, you know, uh, name and likeness and face, and then put her in a movie that she never agreed to be in, have her say right. things that she never agreed to say. Right. Adam, like, given that, you know, you produced um, 30 second spots for major brands and I've undoubtedly worked with SAG talent. What's your take on the current strike and, and I guess the implications of AI on content creation um, in general, especially when it comes to talent? Um, it's obviously a huge issue and a huge concern. Uh, I mean, I, I read um, a bit of that report with Sarah Silverman yeah. um, suing ChatGPT. You know, I think internally in our agency, we are primarily using it as a tool to unlock and unleash creativity, not replace anything. Right. I think we're, we, but we are using it to generate talent, right? And, but I, but I say that from like, a, instead of spending, two to 10 hours on Google or Getty Images, finding the right person to hand off to casting, we're generating that person and then giving very specific direction on where to go. We're definitely not in the camp or even entertaining the idea of using someone's likeness in marketing material that we haven't paid for or acquired. Right. And so, you know, like WPP, um, our holding company is working with, you know, partners like Getty, Adobe, to um, uh, understand the licensing better and how we can utilize it for future efforts. I will say, you know, I don't think anyone has it truly figured out. Uh, Lee just mentioned text to video. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's text to audio video, which also adds another complication. I think right now we're just dipping our toe in the possibilities. Um, Google's rolling out products as well. But I think we're staying away from any legal, uh, future legal issues right now and, and really recognizing that real talent comes with experience and craft. And we absolutely want to support SAG actors, talent and creatives across the board. Um, but uh, we are definitely dipping our toe in and trying and discovering what the possibilities are. Yeah, I mean, I guess the rub comes when brands might start to expect efficiencies 
from production mm -hmm. companies and agencies that could theoretically only be gained through a disproportionate use of these AI technologies. And then, then you have the real discussions because you're going to be forced or they'll go and, elsewhere, right? Yeah, and I think there's like moral and ethical things yep. to have dis discussions around as well, you know, w without mentioning brands, you know, I think internally we are against using diverse talent generated by AI in our advertising to say we use diverse talent. Right. I would rather hire the talent that we feel is appropriate for our advertising than to just generate it. But it does balance that fine. You do balance that fine line too if you're creating stuff for the metaverse or blockchain or utilizing AI within other AI tools. Um, but it is definitely a sensitive topic and we're having moral and ethical conversations with a lot of our clients uh, as well as internally. Yeah, I absolutely. wondered if either one of you have <clears throat> have watched the uh, Black Mirror episode. Joan yeah. is awful. Okay, I, I mean I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but it, uh, if anyone at all is interested in the seemingly um, you know well, Hayek, dystopian right? conversation, it yeah it it is a really um, a really timely, um, funny but really interesting uh, idea that that it that it talks about in that. So yeah, it's um, fascinating. I, excuse me, yeah, absolutely. I, I do agree, Matt, to your earlier comment about, uh, or both of you guys about proof of identity. You know, I think part of um, why I paid, outright paid for the verification check on, on Twitter or now X and Facebook and, and Instagram is uh, to protect my identity, you know, in a lot of ways. And I think we may see an element of that plus the tie to the blockchain uh, as, a, as, a, as a way to own your own identity and, and protect your privacy. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So shifting gears a little bit just to the topic um, at hand, which is education and back to school, you know, Lee, just given the work that you guys do and given the growing impact of AI on students and the education system as a whole, you know, who do you think is responsible for kind of regulating or standardizing the use of AI? By, by students? And, and, and where do you think that is all headed? Because it's obviously the future use of AI is going to be largely governed by how kids are taught it in school, right? So yeah. it's not about what they're doing now. It's about the implications towards the future. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, the, the um, optimist in me would say this needs to be, you know, uh, really fleshed out at the uh, federal level. Um, that's, that's not going to happen. I don't think that... Uh, um, you know, governments have really shown the insight um, or the ability to move quickly enough to be able to, to make meaningful um, changes from a government standpoint. I really, for it, from our standpoint, we take a neutral sort of, um, we take a neutral stance when it comes to AI generated content. Plagiarism is a pretty clear cut. Um, it's wrong. And so you just don't do it. But with AI content, we leave it up to the different schools. And, and what we saw in the beginning was a, a, a real natural sort of um, reaction to go, no, not allowed, to very quickly going, you know what, we actually are going to, to uh, allow a bit more of this. But what we really have seen and what we really hope continues to happen in the short to midterm is that a tool like ours helps to start a conversation and brings a human into the loop to do a proper analysis. And I think human in the loop is the term that we all need to have. That should be the term of 2024. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, it's, it's really, we really need to make sure that we don't uh, offload too much of the responsibility um, uh, to, to these AI systems. And we also need to just think uh, based on data on how things have impacted before. And, we, and, and one of our pre-conversations, Matt, you had mentioned that we don't even have a year's worth of data to to you know, analyze what's happening in this world. And, and what we found also in the world of AI, a month is a year, um, yeah. a, a minimum. The amount of the rate of change, the amount of research, the amount of you know, the step functions that will happen very soon in AI, uh, it's, it, it's gonna seem quaint looking back now at some of the questions that we have. But what we've, we've found that schools have, have been pretty quick and pretty agile in how they're approaching now the implementation of of our tools to, to just locate AI generated text, you know, because it's not always a, uh, automatically a negative thing. 
um, but it really depends on on how you're you're utilizing it. If you're using the output and the completion of an AI chatbot, and then going in and flushing out more of it, editing it, you know, editing, taking, um, you know, adding citations, uh, you know, and building it out, and it's a, literally like a study partner, a writing partner, a, cre a creative circle that you can have with with this tool. Um, I think that's nothing but a good thing. Um, and I'm also encouraged by some of the ed tech companies out there, you know, um, Quizlet with their, their QBot um, is a really cool tool. I got a early beta access to that and I played around with that. I have some personal uh, interest in, in uh, literacy, you know, and so um, I've played around with the idea of, um, you know, taking texts and, and uh, or taking story ideas and making them into decodables where I say, listen, write this so that it's a short phonetic story. Don't think anything multisyllabic, you know, create this decodable text so that it's easy for a kid who's kindergarten, first grade, second grade to read. You know, all these tools are really going to enhance. And we're seeing in a pretty quick way schools um, moving um, kind of gracefully into, into this. Not all of them, but many of them say, we're actually excited by it, but we need to understand where it is. And, and call it out when there's an egregious sort of, I didn't do the work, I just had ChatGPT do it versus, sure. no, I, I used it, but I, I think I wrote the best thing I ever wrote using this. It was an excellent experience, right? So yeah. that's where we want it to go. Yeah. So we have a question from the audience um, from Ivan who wrote, um, what are some ideas on what kind of meaningful roles brands can play in breaking down parents' unease about advancing AI tech, particularly in a classroom? So Adam, as a storyteller, you know, if you got a brief, um, from a brand that was looking at playing that role of breaking down parents' unease around AI in the classroom, what would see some of the angles that you would potentially want to pursue and how brands can kind of create a, a framework for that? Oh, man. Um, that's, a good, that's a good question. I think, I think off the top of my head, you know, I think off the top of my head, I would unpack the difference between like GPT and MidJourney and other AI tools. Cause I think when we bucket sure, them, platforms. yeah, all yeah. together, it, it, um, it, it tends to blend. You know, I think, I think from a visual standpoint, um, I see a real opportunity for brands to help kids or even parents help kids use visuals to explain ideas, right? We know, I think we all know how hard it is sometimes to like write down how you're feeling emotionally um, or stories you want to tell. So you can use some of these visuals to help illustrate uh, the ideas that you want to bring to life where maybe, you know, your talent level, your Photoshop skills are not there yet. So I think using visuals to be visual storytellers uh, is a great way to learn how to use language through prompts. Um, and, and then I think from a, maybe a, a writing standpoint, brands um, can allow kids to fill in the blanks, almost like our Mad Libs days. Um, mm. where they're completing some of the sentences to continue that imagination and fuel that storytelling in ways uh, we weren't able to in the past. I mean, Im just imagine that. Like, imagine Very if cool. Mid Journey was connected to Mad, Mad, Mad Libs back, back when we were kids. Mm. Uh, it would have been a really interesting result. Yeah, or even so, like Choose Your Own Adventure. I was thinking, like, yes. I read books, Choose Your Own Adventure, where you could say where you want the story to go, and, and this could... It's a great application for that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. There's so many possibilities. Yeah. This is a, it's a great question. I don't know, Lee, Lee do you have any thoughts? Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, first of all, what's important for, for parents to, to learn, um, and, and I try to kind of say this as much as I can, is that <clears throat> these tools are only as good as the prompt that goes into them. Um, so, you know, it, you can really get a lot out of um, you know, ChatGPT or Claude or Bard, uh, if you learn how to prompt them and you learn how to design what goes into them. So, you know, if parents think that, that uh, especially if they don't know a lot about this tech, they think that kids are just going to go in there and they're going to get all these answers and then this great thing's going to come out of it. The reality is actually the opposite. You know, the, the, the zero shot prompt or, you know, no example prompt, um, you know, that goes in, and the output is this kind of rambling thing that's a bunch of stuff that's made up. I mean, um, that is not how you use these things. They're not search engines is the main thing to, to make sure that parents understand. Uh, they're really um, a reflection of the insight 
uh, and the design of the question and the prompt that goes into them. And they, you know, what comes out, it only reflects uh, the quality of what went into it. Um, and that idea is pretty simple to grasp because there's a lot of examples in the world where it's, you know, you only get what you put in, right? So they're, they're the same in that sense. Um, and then I think, you know, the, the other component of it um, is, is like you're mentioning, you know, integrating these two things together can be a really wonderful thing. I, I use Claude every night to, to tell my daughter two original stories um, that wow. she's the main character. Very and cool. there are these, she has these two pets, Misty and Max, a dog and a cat. Um, and in Claude, since it's got such a big context window and it's such a talented writer, it's better than all of the other ones combined. It's just the writing comes out as incredible. C-L-A-U-D-E. C-L-A-U-D-E. Yeah. By a company called Anthropic. Um, they're a highly aligned, uh, language model and their chat, um, is very safe. Um, you know, you can't goad it into do, uh, much, you know, negative behavior. It's very conscious of all that. But the writing is so excellent that every night I'm like, honey, what do you want? the story to be about tonight. And she'll say, oh, about this, or, or I'll come up with a story. And, and it writes these wonderful stories. And one time I was in, a, in an Uber with my daughter and her friend taking them to a, uh, a Girl Scouts event downtown. And uh, they were kind of getting restless. So I was like, all right, you know what, girls, I'm going to write a story about you. I wrote a story about the two of them um, I, in Claude. And then I, I had um, Mid Journey create a few images from the story. And in the Uber ride, they had a custom story with custom images for the two of them and what yeah. happened in the story. And it was like magic, you know, it was like magic. And in that moment, I was like, I was just trying to keep them entertained, but what just happened was really magical. Um, right. yeah. And if you play out like there, it could be episodic or the kids could help direct where the story goes next, or you can introduce new characters. There's really exactly. no limit to where you could take it and where the kids take their imaginations. Yeah, that, exactly. That, that's a Good point, Matt. It's really like discover it alongside with the kid, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's that old like, um, you know, advice we would get maybe as parents where it's like, uh, if your kid has a question, discover it on the internet with them versus them discovering it on their own. And I think, I think that's a great way for parents to, to learn about it alongside with their child Yeah, is mm -hmm. to discover it with them. Uh, start to Lee's point with those simple zero prompts and start discovering what the possibilities will unlock. Absolutely. Yeah. We won't go, so we only have a couple of minutes left. I'd love to wrap up with a question that I have for each of you. Um, if you had to look forward maybe four or five years from now into how AI is being used in the classroom, um, K through 12 by, by students and teachers, what are some of the applications that you think will be indoctrinated and, and, and kind of operationalized into the curriculums? Um, I'll start with you, Lee, in terms of where is it all headed? Yeah, I mean, what I would love to see um, and what I believe, I'm very bullish on AI. I think it's going to absolutely revolutionize. It's the third major disruption in humanity. Um, you know, agriculture, industrialization, AI. Um, you know, education and medicine are the two places that are the big disruptors that are going to literally change the world. Um, and I, I hope and I imagine uh, that a personalized AI for each student that takes into account their learning styles, where, they, where they're strong, where they need help, it's specifically fine-tuned to them, uh, and it's always there as uh, an always-on tutor um, that can help them not give answers, but to help them literally with their in education plan. Um, you know, this is going to open up equity in education across the globe, not just for, you know, uh, hopefully not just for rich people in, in you know, the first world countries, but all over the planet. Everyone gets their own personalized AI uh, education assistant. I think that's that's the rose-colored future that I hope we see, and sooner than later. That's fantastic, Adam. Final words on it. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. I think, I think that these personalized curriculums are going to actually give teachers more time to be teachers, and to be empathetic and nurture our our, our kids and students. Um, and I think not only will these personalized curriculums help advance them, it won't leave them behind. Uh, and, and to Lee's point, it won't just be, you know, first world problems, it really will be something that can help the masses at large um, uh, and, and really start growing uh, the next generation. I love that. Well, we're gonna leave it with that. 
Uh, this has been fascinating. We could go on for hours, I feel like, on this topic, but I really want to thank our special guest, uh, Adam Kahn, Chief Creative Officer for Gray, as well as Lee Gall, Director of Growth from Copy Leaks, uh, for helping us with today's edition of uh, the Say the Consumer. I uh, hope to see you guys in future editions. Until then, have a great summer, everyone. So uh, see you soon. And um, let's thank you, everyone. Day. I take, space yeah. takes us. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone. Have a good one.